Hi, welcome. I'm, uh, I'm James Cooper. I'm uh, an associate professor of law and the director of the program on economics and privacy at George Mason's Antonin Scalia Law School. And I'm pleased to be here moderating a panel that's gonna look at uh, antitrust and the next administration uh, as part of the Global Antitrust Institute's uh, <clears throat> educational programs. So uh, let me just give, we have a, a really great panel to, to discuss these issues. I'll just give some brief introductions. Uh, so first we have Maureen Olhausen. Uh, Maureen is the chair of the Global Antitrust and Competition Practice at Baker Botts. Uh, she is a commissioner and former acting chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and prior to coming back as a commissioner, she was the director of the Office of Policy Planning at the Federal Trade Commission. Mike Hades, who I also know from the FTC, uh, was an advisor to uh, John Leibowitz uh, uh, <clears throat> for uh, dear, when, he was, when he was chairman. And he's currently the director of markets and competition policy at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. And then uh, finally, last but not least, we have Tom Lambert. Tom is the wall chair in corporate law and governance and a professor of law at the University of Missouri Law School. He's widely published and a widely respected academic in the field of antitrust. So we have a, uh, again, we have a fantastic panel. Uh, we have limited amount of time. Uh, the one thing I'd say before we get started is if, that if you have any questions, we hope to reserve a little bit of time at the, at the end of this for some Q&A from the audience. So if you have any questions, please uh, uh, put them into the Q&A and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get to them. All right, so uh, before we dive into some substance, I'd like to take advantage of the fact that we've got two people on the panel here who have actually been at the FTC during transition. Mike, as I'd mentioned, was an advisor to Chairman Leibowitz in 2009. So he was there as, uh, as, as uh, commissioner and then Chairman Leibowitz moved from being a commissioner to, to being chair, uh, taking over for the reins from Bill Kovacic. And then more recently, uh, Maureen sort of served as acting chairman for about a year and a half uh, during the transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. So, you know, one thing just for the audience uh, to know is, you know, kind of what is going on behind the scenes now. You know, I know there are transition teams or there's there are landing teams. Uh, you know, how does, uh, as you begin to take over the reins of power in an agency like the FTC, um, how do you go about preparing a new agenda and uh, you know, how easy is it to change the ship or if you have to go on a new policy direction, how, how do you go about even starting to, to, to implement that? So let me go to, to go to Maureen first and then Mike for any reactions. So Maureen. Great, th thanks James, uh, delighted to be here and, and talking about some of the behind the scenes nuts and bolts kinds of things that happen in a transition. So one of the big sayings in Washington is, is that personnel is policy. And that is an important part of the transition where they, everyone focuses on the Senate confirmed positions, but there's a whole layer below that that's also very important. So the, um, the transition team will be getting a list of the, um, the uh, SES positions, the political SES positions that might be open at an agency or available to be, to be filled. There's very few of them at the Federal Trade Commission, but at other agencies, there might be quite a bit. And a lot of the policy work can get done through that kind of level. Uh, the other thing is budget, right? Budget is a big, big issue. And you know what? Uh, what budget does the agency have? What's available? What you know? What does that look like? Um, other big uh, outstanding issues that the agency might be facing. A cat, you think of uh, you know an agency certainly like the FTC. They're an enforcer. They bring cases. Like kind of what what's uh, what's in the pipeline? What are they thinking about? There are some restrictions um, about also what what types of information can be shared, but like bigger picture kinds of things. Um, and also all agencies are also operating somewhat as a business, right? So do they have uh, litigation against them? What's the, stat what's the status of that? Um, are there, um, you know, big challenges? Like right now the FTC obviously has, you know, its um, authority is being challenged in the Supreme Court. Uh, there may be other I issues. There's also, you know the administrative kinds of kinds of issues are there uh, issues involving the 
you know, the building or personnel or, you know, the, those kinds <clears> of things, the, the IT system, you know, th things like that. Even inspector general, right? They're looking for fraud, waste, and abuse. So, so all those things kind of get put together and the, um, uh, and the different entities within the, um, the agency prepare a report uh, for the uh, for the transition team. So some of it is more nuts and bolts of people and money and you know liabilities, and then some of it is more like program programmatic. Here's you know the work that we have. Here are the cases that are public that are in process uh, and and things like that. And then they'll go and talk to the to the leadership of the agency, the bureau heads, the um, uh, the there's like. There's only some people who are permitted to talk, well, not everybody can, but there's, you know, for the permitted people and particularly like the commissioners, they'll come in, they'll talk to you, you know, what, what do you think needs to be done? Where, you know, what would you recommend? So they kind of pull all that together, I think, into then um, a plan for as the new people come on board. Well, well, thanks, Maureen. So, so Mike, you like I said, you had some experience as well, uh, advise being an advisor uh, to John as he made made the transition. So, you know, during your time there, uh, picking up from uh, from what Maureen said, I mean, how and obviously John had been a commissioner for for a while before that. How do you go about thinking about uh, a new agenda, and and then how do you go about implementing it? How do you uh, how, how do you how does that how does that process work? Is it is it difficult? Is it hard? Does it take a while to kind of move this big ship? Um, well, first, let me say, uh, let me just echo, Maureen, thank you for, for having me. And I think this is a great and timely topic. Um, and <clears throat> obviously, Maureen was, as the actual political appointee and, and the, the acting chair, I think, um, in terms of the, the transition, has had much better insight. Um, as as attorney advisor, I only heard snippets of things going on, so like probably not even worthwhile to repeat what I heard. Um, so I'm glad you asked me about agenda. And well, you know, I think it is sort of the case. It all it, 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 sort of following on what what Maureen said about personnel as policy. A lot of it, it, it does depend on who the person is and how they are going to operate. So in some sense, the agenda for Chairman Leibowitz was fairly at once, part of it was fairly easy because he was committed to the commission's already important, what was already important to the commission, which was attacking patent settlements. Um, and so there it was much more granular about how to actually sort of uh, take that agenda item and maybe put, and put it on steroids, frankly. I mean, I, you know, it wasn't that, it was a difference in that, he was any any more concerned about it than Chairman uh, Acting Chairman Kavasik had been, or even or Chairman Majoris, or Chairman Miras, or Chairman Potofsky. Um, I hope I didn't miss any in that long line. Um, but it was really sort of okay. Let's look at what we have been doing. What resources can we pull out of the the, the policy shop? What what do we need to be doing and thinking about um, congressional relations? So that was very sort of nuts and boltsy. Um, the other thing we did that John, he actually set aside um, either a two or three day um, recess for his senior staff and, and he brought in all, all, the, the, all the, the, the previous chairman and had them talk both Republican and Democrat. Um, and you know, honestly, um, I, I would say Chairman Muris um, of all the, the speakers really sort of laid out thinking about whether you're, you're, you want to commission chairman either focus externally or internally and how, how what you have to do if you, if you want it to be external uh, so for that you, where the, the commission needs to be thinking about externally versus internally. Um, and that really, I think, also helped think about, uh, helped us develop on the BCP side where the, the decision was to focus on mortgage fraud um, and uh, debt collection fraud, uh, and um, also to, to set this, yeah, to, so that's how we sort of kind of def defined the, the agenda where we, where we wasn't sort of just sort of amping up a pre-existing agenda item. It was both sort of taking, a, a, as I said, inventory from those who had come before, what they had done, what had worked, and then also 
talking internally with, with the various offices and staff to try to figure out what's worked or what needed to be done. Thanks, thanks, Mike and Maureen for kind of uh, laying, uh, giving us a little bit of behind the scenes on, <clears throat> on what's likely to be going on uh, now in the agency. So uh, I want to move now to a little bit of the substance and, you know, the, thinking about the substance of, you know, what type of, but what, what might be some of the substantive changes we, we would see in a new administration. So uh, let's start at a high level. Uh, I, I was looking, you know, Mike, you're the, the Center for Equitable Growth just released a, a report uh, and it, it echoes some of the themes that were in the, the House report uh, as well. And it's kind of predicated on this notion. It has a lot of suggested reforms and identifies the problems. And it's, it's predicated in large part of the notion that, that we as a nation have a, we have a competition problem, that there's, there's too much power and too many industries. Uh, so before we delve into you know, possible solutions, I think maybe we should discuss, you know, is this the right baseline? Is there really, is there a competition problem uh, out there so, uh, Tom, let me go to you first, since you were left out of the, 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 first, the first round, but let me go to Tom first, and then I'll go to Maureen and Mike for some, some reaction to this. So, Tom? Thanks, James, uh, and, and thanks also for having me on this panel. I've followed uh, the work of Maureen and Mike for a long time and, um, and have learned quite a bit from both of them, uh, so I'm honored to be on this panel. Um, I particularly enjoyed reading the CEG report that you referenced, James. Um, and I found myself agreeing with quite a bit that's in that report. Uh, it begins with this statement, excessive market power plagues the US economy. That's the first sentence. And that does seem to be the premise on which um, the House Judiciary uh, Committee's report and this report, um, that, that's, that's the premise that they're based on. Um, and that claim that we're in some sort of midst, the midst of some sort of market power crisis seems to have become conventional wisdom. Um, I think that this claim of increasing market power is questionable at best and possibly flat out wrong. Um, there, it seems to be based really on three trends. Uh, one is a trend in, of increasing industrial concentration in the US. Uh, a second is this trend of in, increasing profit margins by US firms. And then third, um, a reduced labor share. Basically, laborers are taking less of the surplus created by firms for themselves, which um, people are saying may stem from market power among the buyers of, of labor, so market power on the buy side. I think if you look closely at the evidence um, on these three purported trends, uh, it's less clear than it's been made out to be. So we can take them one by one. Um, if you start with the increasing industrial concentration, there are a couple of studies that are widely cited um, demonstrating this increasing industrial concentration. One was from the uh, Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama administration. Um, the CEA looked at uh, the top 50 firms in industries that were defined at the two digit industry classification level. So that's really broad industries like retail trade and transportation and warehousing. And they found that um, the uh, revenue shares of the 50 largest firms in those, those industries had grown substantially over time. Um, the Economist magazine did a similar study. They looked at the revenue shares of the top four firms in uh, slightly narrower industries. These were industries defined at the four digit industry code level, but even those are, are really broad things like other food manufacturing, which includes uh, coffee and tea manufacturing and roasted nuts and peanut butter manufacturing. I mean, very, very different things. The, these are not even remotely markets. I mean, markets are, you know, ranges of economic activity in which competitive processes determine price and quantity. It's quite possible that you'd have an in increasing uh, industrial concentration at these high level industry points and yet have decreasing concentration at uh, market levels. And in fact, there's some good evidence that that's what's happening. There's a recent study by economists from Princeton and, and the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. This is the Rossi-Hasberg study. 
Um, and it documents sort of these diverging trends between national and local market concentration and it include, concludes that while national concentration is increasing, local concentration is not. In fact, the authors find, this is a quote from the paper, that local concentration has been declining rapidly for the last 25 years when we measure concentration at the, at the city, county, or zip code level. So uh, I mean, it's not clear to me that we have this increasing concentration at, the mar at market levels. Now, with respect to the second uh, purported trend, increasing profit margins, uh, there have been a couple of high-profile studies here. Um, uh, I, I call um, one of them the Jan's study because the, the two authors are Jan, Jan Delecker and Jan Ekaup. Uh, they examined markups over cost at U.S. firms from 1980 to 2014, and they found that they had substantially increased in that time from 18% to 67%. That's a was very significant increase. Um, there was also a 2018 study by the International Monetary Fund that found that markups had grown on a sales weighted average um, by 42% between 1980 and, 19, and 2016. Um, now, both of these studies, you know, they're looking at the markup of price over cost, but for measuring cost, they used the cost of goods sold measure which is a measure that excludes selling general and administrative expenses, so so-called SGA expenses. So if, if SGA expenses have become a bigger part of producers' costs from 1980 until, until today, um, then you'd expect to see uh, uh, greater markups over the cost of goods measure. Um, James Traina at the University of Chicago replicated the Delecker and Ecout, the Jans study, using uh, a measure of cost that was operating expenses. And operating expenses includes cost of goods served plus SGA selling general and administrative costs. And he found that when you change the cost measure like that, um, there's only a slight increase in profit margins since 1980. And even that is within historical variation. So they increased from 80 until today, about the same as they decreased from 1950 to 1980. Um, now, one other thing to note here on these profit margins study studies, to the extent that there's an increase in markup over variable cost, which is what these studies have looked at, you know, that could be because of changes in the type of things that are being sold from 1980 to today. Um, you know, a, a seller's prices have to cover its total costs including its fixed costs. So when fixed costs become a bigger part of a seller's total costs, then the markup of a variable cost is, is obviously going to have to be greater. Um, now, significant fixed costs for sellers are technology, intellectual property, regulatory compliance. And it's, it's highly likely, I think, that in today's economy, producers are spending more on those sorts of fixed costs, which means they're gonna end up charging higher markups over variable costs even if there's no increase in market power. So that brings us to the last of the three sort of purported uh, trends, and that's the reduced labor share. Um, there are some studies that point to a reduction in the percentage of firm surplus that's being paid to laborers. And the authors suggest that this shows some increase in market power on the buy side. Increased concentration among employers means they don't have to compete as hard for laborers, and so laborers are, are uh, being paid less. But even if the labor share is falling, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's growing market power among purchasers of labor. Um, the labor share would drop if the marginal contribution of labor fell relative to the marginal contribution of capital and managerial talent. And there are good reasons to think that that, that may be occurring. I mean, consider the marginal value that a secretary produces today versus 25 years ago. It was significantly greater 25 years ago than, than today. So market power occasioned by lax antitrust standards may not be the culprit here. When we look globally, it seems that there are good reasons to doubt that lax US antitrust standards are to blame for this falling labor share. Um, as it turns out, this falling labor share is a global phenomenon and the US is sort of in the middle. So there are lots of countries that have antitrust regimes that are significantly stricter than ours that have seen an even larger drop in the labor share. Um, the decline in labor share from 1975 to 2012 was greater in Japan, Canada, Italy, France, Germany, 
China, Mexico, and Poland than it was in the U.S. So it's not clear to me that we can blame that on market power occasioned by lax U.S. antitrust standards. Um, so <laughs> bottom line, I think there are reasons to be skeptical of the sort of conventional wisdom that we are in the midst of a, a market power crisis. Well, thanks, Tom. Maureen, do you, do you have anything to add to, uh, to, to Tom's? Well, I, I really appreciate Tom's careful analysis because I do think, um, you know, early on when so, some of this was emerging, I did write an article point, pointing out some of the, the flaws in, in, in looking at this kind of big buckets of census data and, and trying to uh, come up with, um, you know, an antitrust market out of that. But, but I think the other important thing is even putting aside do we have a concentration issue? Is antitrust, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, not doing what it's supposed to be doing? I, I think it's important to think about what are the kinds of problems that people are identifying, and what's the right solution for those. Um, so one of the things that I've found in this debate is we often, uh, you know, we talk about whether consumer welfare is the right is the right standard for antitrust because I haven't really seen necessarily that um, these issues have led to um, problems for consumer, you know, variety or cost and, you know, quality, those, those kinds of things. I mean, sometimes there are some complaints about that, but, but I think other issues have kind of come to the fore of, for people saying that we need to, antitrust needs to be um, revved up or, or doing something differently. So um, we're talking about, you know, concerns about growing uh, political power of uh, big companies um, that might have a large market a large share in, in circuit markets. Um, there are often pointed to uh, issues about um, lack of new business formation. You know, is is uh, are big companies to blame for that? Um, and that we do we want more business uh, formation. Uh, data control of, of data. Do companies have too too much too much data? Um, and the labor issues, which I think are very worthy uh, of of inquiry. And um, one of the things that I really liked about the, uh, the CEG report was um, their suggestion that there be a position, well, first of all, I'll say the recognition of the work the FTC has done in, the, in these areas. Um, they looked at the state action doctrine, as we all know, that protected a lot of regulation on small entrepreneurs trying to get into new markets um, that you know, was challenged but, but all the way up to the Supreme Court for the Tooth Whiteners case. When I was the acting chairman, I uh, founded the Economic Liberty Task Force uh, to take a look to take a look at these issues for the perception for a lot of people that you know it's just very difficult to kind of start to start a business these days. Um, so I, I really appreciated, first of all, the report mentioning you know that focus work that was really started with Tim Muras and the State Action Task Force, um, the FTC's competition advocacy work but also some of these bigger issues that may not just be at, laid at the doorstep of antitrust. Uh, so that um, the, the recommendation that there be kind of an overarching position uh, in the White House that looks at competition writ large. I think, that, I think that's a really wise um, idea um, because whether you think antitrust is doing its job or not doing its job, I think there's a lot of people who also think there are other barriers to competition that are occurring um, through throughout the economy through you know other forms of regulation or lack of regulation or you know there's some other levers that could be brought to bear so I think that was a really valuable contribution um, to look at so we so even if we may or may not agree about whether there's an overall concentration problem I think there's a lot of agreement on the idea that we could be doing more to foster competition throughout our economy. And, you know, when you look at like, for example, um, Australia a number of years ago kind of took this global uh, look, I'm, I'm by global, I mean within, <laughs> within Australia, but all the regulations and, and rules to see if there's some adjustments that could be made to help spur their economy. And I think that's really good, a good idea. I think, it get, you know, would get a lot of support across the board. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Maureen. Let me, um, Mike, there's a lot on the plate, some, some agreeing, some, some uh, disagreeing a little bit with the premise of the CEG report. 
Um, so, you know, I'd like to, to get your reaction to that and then, and then maybe uh, be a good segue into you discussing, uh, you know, the, your, the, the CG report calls on Congress to act in, in three dimensions, you know, on substance, procedure, and funding. And maybe you could talk a little bit, uh, in addition to react to anything you heard from Tom and Maureen, uh, you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what sort of congressional action that you, that you have in mind here. Um, sure. Um, I was just afraid at the end of that, you were gonna say I had 15 seconds to do all that. Um, that's implied, right? I mean, oh, that's yeah. implied, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, so let me first sort of, um, I mean, I think, I think Tom raised uh, uh, important issues about, about the research uh, that, that um, he's, he's discussing um, and glad that I'm always happy when uh, Maureen thinks I've done some good work. Um, um, but let me first start by sort of putting this in the report in a little bit of context. So the report, there is clearly, and there will continue to be a debate about whether we have a market power or concentration or competition problem in the United States. Um, and we should keep having that discussion. The report really was less, that, that, that there's a lot there elsewhere. And the report really was not about whether there was, is a problem. But if you think there's a problem, this is how to make antitrust and competition policy more effective. So like we didn't spend a lot of time. What I would say is, you know, Tom, I'm glad you, you quoted the first sentence, which says there's a market power problem. I think it was very, that was a very carefully chosen phrase. We did not, that report does not say there's a concentration problem, which I would think reflects the fact that the co-authors included you know, Professor Nancy Rose, Professor Fiona Scott Morton, Professor Carl Shapiro, Professor Jonathan Baker, these are all IO economists, right? These are all people who certainly understand this sort of, this, the non-IO studies that are being cited, understand the weaknesses. And I, right, what I think the report reflects is their concerns are not driven, I mean, I think they have various views on, on that literature, but their concerns are being driven by two things, one, the literature coming out of the IO um, scholarship that is consistently showing that they just, I think, you know, I don't mean to speak for them, but you know, the number of industries where there seems to be substantial monopoly, po monopoly power, hospitals, dialysis machines, airlines, beer, home building, agriculture, right? I think, you know, we can talk about at what point you wanna say that means we have a large problem, but the concern of the, the these authors is not being driven heavily driven by the types of sort of the, the macro evidence that sort of the, the press likes because you know it's sort of I get it like it sort of gives you a bottom line overall answer um so I think that's really important and I think that's a really important part of that debate that sometimes gets lost um that you know at this point it's not just sort of the uh the Jans who not very good economists um or the Van Rienens on the other side um, these are solid IO economists who certainly, you know, are some of the best in the world who are, have, have come to this judgment. Uh, the second part is their view that they, when they, uh, their experience in antitrust litigation is that the, the courts are focusing on the wrong things and not understanding what good economics teaches. Um, so I think that's why this, the authors of this report feel like there is a, a market power problem in the economy and it's based largely on their experience and literature from, from industrial organizations. Um, I do want to talk a little briefly um, uh, what Tom said. Um, that I, think that mo I, I think all, as I said, the issues he's raising are important ones. What I would say about all of that literature, one, I don't, in some sense, I don't, it doesn't surprise me that markups have increased for the reasons he said, like we, we are more, the, the, fixed costs, R&D is a more important part of the economy, but that doesn't change the fact that that still means that there is more market power. It may not be the result of failed antitrust enforcement, but in an economy where there is more market power, there's more incentive to abuse and use it. And so antitrust standards that existed for a time when where there wasn't a lot of market power are likely to under-enforce the law, right? And this is a point actually um, that Professor Van Rienen um, who's one of the authors on the Superstar paper, the Superstar Firm paper, which makes the point that it argues that the growth in markups in the economy are due to the most productive firms. Um, 
that paper actually but says like but it still can be a problem going forward and thinking about your antitrust enforcement um so um um and i also think you know i i'm not my reaction to to, to uh marine statement is um I think largely, yes. I mean, at least I think her reading the report is right. We that this is this is a report aimed at problems in uh, what we see as a market power problem, um, not that we yeah, you know, and very much about what antitrust enforcement can do. Um, we think that improving competition has external benefits, um, but that's different than saying we should be using antitrust laws to address sort of social political power. Um, Right, that's a very important distinction that we tried to make. Um, so um, I don't know, did I catch everything you wanted me to raise before moving on to the next question? I, I, I will say yes. As moderator, I will give you permission to move on to the next question. So yeah, why don't you, you talk a little bit about the, the congressional reforms that, that, that you have in mind, and then I, I'd like to go to Tom for some reactions. Right. So again, I think the way to think about our report is it is sort of the, if you disagree about what the problem is or the scope of the problem is, there's a lot of things you're going to disagree with in the report. So the report reflects a view that antitrust law is failing to capture modern modern economic theory is way too, is much too lenient towards dominant firm conduct, too lenient as to um, um, the courts are too lenient towards horizontal vertical mergers. And so, and that that's largely driven by court interpretations of the law, which is their job. Um, but it also says that the notion that all you need to do is bring more cases or that the, the agencies are a lot largely responsible for where we are is I think misguided and is a misdiagnosis. And so I think what our feeling was, yes, there needs to be a big change, that change needs to come from Congress. And in some sense, that's Congress's job. The courts have clearly made it clear what they think the antitrust laws mean. And you can try to change that through the courts. I always call that like the 50 year plan, um, which at this point now I'm old enough that I mean would be probably I won't be alive at that point. Um, but the other option is Congress gets to decide what the antitrust laws means above the courts. And so if we think there's a big problem, you need a big solution. And so you need the courts to, to, to I mean, so you need Congress to, to really to reestablish, say what it thinks the, the antitrust laws mean, or define what they mean. And so we put that into three, three buckets uh, and I'll, I'll sort of reverse it. So of the, the, the from starting with the, the smallest going to the biggest, we, we, the, the smallest I think, and the one that seems to have the most universal broad base acceptance is that the antitrust, the enforcement agency's budgets are no, do not reflect what we demand of them. Um, and that, I think, right, it, it, you know, there, there, you can look at this in a lot of different ways between 2010 and the, the, the present. And if you, by real terms, the agency's budgets are actually 15 to 20% lower in real terms than they were in 2010. If you wanna just compare the size of the, the growth in the economy, the economy is growing twice as fast as as the uh, as the agency's uh, resources have. So you know one would expect if as agent if economic activity increases, there's more there's more conduct to be policed, and yet you don't have you have less sort of uh, resources to police that. Uh, you know, obviously, um, I think it was the same day as as our event launch and the launch of the report was when somebody leaked the FTC's executive directors. Um, uh, memo talking just to how tight the budget is. Um, so we advocate for a pretty big um, increase. Uh, essentially, uh, we increase resources, uh, essentially triple resources for antitrust in enforcement. And that was based on a notion that we sort of decided that what that would allow the agencies to bring twice as many cases, but also deal with the other policy requirements that people are talking about, whether it be merger retrospectives, the kind of um, advocacy at the state level that that you know, was important during Marines' uh, tenure um, and other sort of policy studies. The second bucket was things that are, are less, are sort of process oriented that we think don't 
that impede antitrust enforcement in ways that isn't aren't relevant to the merits. So one, uh, Maureen did touch on this. Um, the Supreme Court is hearing whether the FTC has the power uh, when it finds a violation to disgorge, take away the ill-gotten gains of, of the from the violation or and, and uh, rest give restitution to those harmed by it. Um, I think if the if, if the the court um, agrees that the FTC doesn't have that power, um, it, that is makes it very hard, I think, for the agency to to effectively create deterrence, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, right? Um, so again, if you really, right, regardless of whether you think there's a problem or not, you should you should understand that a, a general problem with market power, I should say, not sort of giving making not giving the the FTC uh, and, and the division sort of tools to to create deterrence, um, particularly in markets with high where there's high incentives like a pharmaceutical industry. Uh, that this just doesn't make it as a matter. Of, I think good government doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, we talked a little bit, uh, another one that sort of, uh, we sort of suggest that that to deal with sort of the concerns about uh, acquisitions with nascent competitors, that you should create a filing system, which I think we call it the quick file system, it doesn't, where just to give government notice, no waiting period, no fees, very, very simple filing um, as a way to just so that the agency understands, the agencies understand what's going on. There's certain other ones that are very sort of detailed oriented, so I'll stop. Um, Hopefully you've all, no, I haven't put anyone to sleep yet. Um, so, but finish with the big ones. Um, um, then the, the big ones is, you know, I think the big substantive changes we we advocate for are reflecting the notion that, that the, the case law where it is, um, there's just case law that is, is a huge hindrance to successful prosecution of exclusionary conduct cases, certain merger cases, um, and a variety of tools uh, that Congress could use to, to push back on that, whether it be sort of vacating those rulings, creating new presumptions, um, or creating new standards that sort of stress the importance of things like potential competition. Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, so let me, uh, Tom, let me uh, see if you have any reactions to that. In particular, I, this is an opportunity to plug your, uh, your report in the GAI's recent report on the digital economy, your chapter, um, which is about rent seeking. And it seems like it would be, you know, you're an especially uh, 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 well-suited panelist to, to discuss some of Mike's proposals, because if Mike's thinking about getting Congress uh, uh, a Congress working in order to 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 alter the antitrust laws in in, in some ways, uh, then you know maybe there's an opportunity uh, for some of the type of rent seeking that, that you discussed in your in in your chapter. You know, for instance, I know you you talked about newspaper publishers and app developers in particular, you know, uh, uh, trying to get antitrust exemptions and here in the U.S. and 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 being more successful in other jurisdictions. So, if you'd like to react a little bit to to, to some of uh, uh, what you think about Mike's proposals and uh, if if you know whether or not you think you know maybe in the current environment that this is right for antitrust rent seeking. Sure. Um, well, again, I, I, let me say that I, there was much in the CEG report that I really liked, and I think we're going to talk toward the end of this conversation about some things that I particularly like. So, well, but if I say negative things now, it's certainly far from wholly negative. Um, so, as uh, James points out, I wrote this paper for the GAI report on the digital economy on, on rent seeking and public choice in digital markets and rent seeking, of course, is just when private firms try to exploit the government's uh, coercive power in order to enhance their profits, they typically do so by getting some subsidy for themselves or by um, somehow raising their rivals costs using the law and rent seeking is typically a bad thing. It reduces competition uh, and it squanders all sorts of resources that could be used for productive ventures. They're instead uh, funneled toward lobbying efforts, et cetera. And rent seeking, you know, is more common uh, when you have some sort of government agency that has a lot of discretionary power over firms and has a lot of contact with them. Dominant firms in a situation like that can capture those agencies and, um, and, hobble their rivals, et cetera. 
So one thing that I really liked about the CEG report is that it doesn't call for the creation of some new sector specific agency to regulate the tech platforms. Um, and it differs in that regard from other recent reports like the Stigler Center report from the University of Chicago and the, the Furman report out of the UK. Um, but rent seeking can occur uh, in the absence of ex ante regulation. Um, you know, one, one way, well, one way is to, you know, lobby Congress for some sort of protection. And I don't see much of that in the CEG report. I will say in the House Judiciary Report, one of the recommendations is that um, news publishers be given an exemption from the antitrust laws. And it's a pretty broad exemption. I mean, that to me seems like uh, a potential rent seeking situ situation, but I don't see that in the CEG report. Um, you know, lawsuits, though, are a potential avenue for rent seeking. And uh, I think a good example of this is Epic Games recent um, lawsuit against Google and, and Apple. Um, Epic is, of course, challenging the App Store policies where uh, you, you have to distribute apps to Android and iOS through the App Stores. And Apple's case, it's exclusive. In Google's case, it's de facto exclusive according to, to Epic. Um, and then the app developers have to use their in-app purchasing systems, Google and Apple's, which allows Google and Apple to take a revenue share, 30% revenue share. Um, Epic files a very high profile lawsuit uh, challenging these, these restraints, saying that they're antitrust violation. And um, so why would I call that rent seeking? Well. As a substantive matter, I think those epic lawsuits are, are, are pretty weak. Um, the challenged restraints are clearly not a product of market power. They were in place when uh, Google and Apple were minuscule players in mobile operating system markets. They've been in place all along um, and they really haven't changed. There are obvious sort of pro-competitive justifications for this system. Um, having some control over apps that are used on the platform protects the platform. Um, and of course, Google and Apple are providing huge benefits to app developers and need to get compensated some way. This is a compensation mechanism for them. Uh, but the most important problem, the most significant defect with the Epic Games um, antitrust actions is that the challenge restraints don't actually enhance Apple and Google's market power in any way. Um, if the challenge restraints were completely overturned, Google and Apple, Apple could still extract similar amounts of surplus from app developers and, and consumers. They could just charge for access to critical APIs. So these challenge restraints don't create market power that wouldn't otherwise exist which is required for liability under US antitrust law. So I think they're really weak lawsuits substantively. So why would Epic file the suits? Well, look how they did it. Um, they committed a high profile breach of their agreements with Google and Apple, which required their apps to be removed from the app stores. Um, then they immediately gained, engaged in this massive publicity campaign. Um, I'm sure you probably saw the, the great, it was actually extremely clever uh, commercial that they released in connection with these lawsuits um, comparing Apple uh, to, uh, you know, Big Brother, just the way Apple had compared IBM to Big Brother when it released the Mac. It's very uh, creative. They launched this uh, free Fortnite hashtag. They had a uh, Fortnite free Fortnite competition on their you know, very popular video game. It's pretty apparent that they're not trying to win in a court of law, but rather in a court of public opinion. Uh, they wanna put pressure on Google and Apple to change the way that it collects revenues from app developers. Well, why would they do that? Um, well, under the current scheme, the system benefits um, makers of less popular apps at the expense of makers of popular apps. I mean, the more popular your app is, the more you end up having to pay, uh, which is probably beneficial to consumers. I mean, it, it, allow, it creates basically an effective subsidy for startup app developers. But of course, Epic doesn't like it at all because they have a very popular app. So it seems to me that what Epic has done is filed a pretty specious lawsuit uh, in order to procure a change that benefits Epic, but doesn't actually reduce market power anyway. 
And that's a rent seeking lawsuit. Now, what does this have to do with the CEG report and the House Judiciary Committee report? Well, part of it is James was allowing me to get a plug in for my paper. So there's the plug. But, but tying it back now to the to CEG report and the House report, I mean, both of these reports call for changes to substantive antitrust law that would make these sorts of strike suits, I think, more common. Now, the House report is, in my opinion, way worse. <laughs> um, but even the CEG report has some suggestions that, that I find troubling. It calls for expanding liability for unilateral refusals to deal, uh, for predatory pricing. Um, it calls for lowering pleading production and proof burdens on plaintiffs. And my own view is that these matters uh, through the common law you know, case development process that, that we've used in antitrust have been pretty well captured to capture truly anti-competitive conduct while not chilling pro-competitive behavior. Um, so, I, you know, we can talk about that more. We're going to talk about monopolization in a bit. We can talk about that more later. Uh, the House Judiciary Committee report goes way further. It eliminates the antitrust standing requirement. It eliminates the antitrust injury requirement. Um, it amends Section 2 to preclude abuse of dominance, which would allow for challenges to behavior that doesn't extend or protect market power, but just extracts surplus. So my concern here is that all of these proposed changes make it much easier to file a spurious lawsuit um, and much harder to get rid of spurious lawsuits. And my concern is that these, these specious lawsuits can be a fruitful avenue for rent seeking. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Tom, and happy to plug your book. I'll take my 30% uh, uh, off the top uh, share like, like any good uh, platform. Uh, but uh, so what I want to move now into is, in our remaining time, is into some of the substance that Tom already previewed a little bit uh, on some of the, the, the substantive proposals to, to change the, the antitrust laws. First, I want to focus on mergers and, and, and turn to, to Maureen. So, you know, one of the big areas concern in the, the, the House report and then, you know, and actually a lot of commentators in, in academia is the idea that, uh, that dominant platforms have grown uh, because they've acquired nascent competitors that, that would have, or, or I should say that the dominant platforms have acquired uh, market power because they've acquired these nascent competitors that perhaps would have grown into substantial competitors. The, the Facebook, Instagram is frequently suggested as an example of this. Uh, uh, Tom, Tom talked about this a little bit, but you know, in the, in the House report, one of the, one of the proposed remedies is to, is to change mer merger presumptions, you know, for perhaps making 30% uh, the threshold uh, require dominant firms to report all the mergers, and then the burden would be on them to prove that they, their acquisitions are, are not uh, anti-competitive. So, uh, I, you know, I'd like to, to ask this, and again, I'll go to you first, Maureen, and, and if anyone else has any reactions, is number one, is the premise correct that, uh, that the gobbling up of nascent competitors is a problem or something that that is that, that we need to be worried about and has led to the accretion of market power by some dominant platforms. Uh, and and what do you think about changing any of these merger presumptions? And of course, I think that probably your answer to number two will have a lot to do with what you think about, about number one. So, so Maureen? As an initial matter, the question of whether a merger could occur where you have um, a large player, you know, maybe dominant player acquiring, um, you know, some new nascent competitor uh, with the idea that they were going to knock them out and disable them. Yeah, it, that can, you know, theoretically, sure, that, that can happen. When I was the chairman, we brought a case called CDK Automate and that we alleged that what was going to occur. Um, and we challenged it and the merger was uh, abandoned. Um, so, so just the idea that this theoretically can happen, however, I don't necessarily think suggests one that current antitrust tools are insufficient to address it when, when it does occur, or two, that it's prevalent, uh, or three, that the cure might not be worse, <laughs> worse than the, than the disease. Um, 
there is a whole um, ecosystem of R&D and investment in this country that is based around the idea that you have a bunch of small startups. They can be very creative. They can take a lot of risks uh, and they get investment um, because one of the exit strategies for them, one of the reasons they might end up you know, being worth investing time and money and you know blood sweat and tears in is the idea that um, a good exit strategy for them is then they might be purchased by a bigger entity that can then give them the support um, the, the the funding the uh, the expertise the you know or maybe it's a good integration into you know an existing platform um, so I think it, it, we really need to keep that counterfactual in mind that if we start to make this, you know, uh, a, a bad path, that we may have a bad, um, a negative impact on that whole, that whole ecosystem. Um, I also think, you know, hindsight's 2020, right? So, so everyone thinks that, oh, of course, X was, you know, going to be destined to take over why, but we see, you know, that, that I think that's really hard, hard, hard to predict. Um, I think it was interesting that a lot of this research was done in the pharma space, where the idea that one drug is going to be a competitor and replacement um, for another is a lot more certain, right? You have that whole pipeline approval process, and I don't think that that is, um, you know, easily transferable to you know most uh, most other businesses um and and the whole like um killer acquisition idea too i think you know is really morphed into this idea also that if you um you create you um acquire um you know some new at you know what 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 have you you know new technology or new you know something or other um and then you uh you give it support you help it grow and it turns into a success that that is a killer ac acquisition too, because you're not, dis it's not like what we were alleging in the CDK Automate case, which was you're going to take that technology and you're gonna, you know, you're going to, you know, sort of downgrade it. Um, and, and I think one of the other things that's not really being captured here is, is, you know, I talked already about the impact on innovation is if these entities are going to continue to, to you know, grow and exist, Okay, does, does that just shift the, um, the make or buy decision into develop it in-house, right? And are we now going to be saying, well, you can't, you can't even develop new capabilities in-house because you might, you know, be, you know, preserving your market position. And then kind of where, where does that lead? I, I think that, that concerns me a lot. If, if what we're ultimately trying to achieve is to say to a big successful platform, you have to stay in your swim lane and you have to, you can't expand, you can't grow, you, you know, you can't innovate. Uh, you just kind of run it out until it dies. I, I don't personally think that's a good outcome for, for con, you know, for our economy or for consumers. And when you see, you know, the integration. So for example, there's a really good video that I would recommend that people see, which looks at, I think it's like your desk, like literally your physical desk, I think it was about 1980. Uh, and it's, you've got a Rolex, you got a calendar, um, sorry, Rolodex, <laughs> get a calendar, you got all these things. And then uh, ultimately they all get integrated into your laptop, right? It's, it's kind of like a time-lapse thing. Like, is that bad? Was that bad for consumers? Was that bad for competition? I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I agree that it is bad. So, so what are we trying, like what's the end game here? I guess is my question. Um, but as for the question of like having some presumptions, I'd be concerned about flipping the presumption. But I'm not like so, you know, out myself as, you know, uh, somebody who even as a Republican, I never um, thought that the Philadelphia National Bank presumption was worth getting rid of. I thought that once, you know, the agencies have done sort of their research and figured out that they think this deal is, you know, a, a, a problem, uh, that was a useful, that was a useful tool. So I'm not someone who's like, you know, no, no presumptions ever. Uh, but I, I am concerned about sort of making uh, the bar so high that one, it affects, you know, investment and innovation. Two, it, um, you know, creates this, this problem where, you know, what we're encouraging companies to do is not to compete as, compete as hard down the road. Right. Well, well, thanks, Maureen. And 
We are we are kind of getting close on time, but uh, Mike, I want to get your reactions. Obviously, there's a uh, a lot put on the table by both Tom and Tom and Maureen, and then uh, uh, and then maybe uh, move on to. I, I'd like to to ask Tom uh, as we trend, talk a little. Maybe Mike, you could you could react and talk a little bit about also you know you, proposals that CEG has in. Um, um, uh, you, the unilateral conduct sphere to get rid of cases like Trinco and Amex, and and then Tom maybe uh, to kind of wrap up. You can uh, you can react to that. So so Mike. Yeah, I'll try to be uh, more concise. Uh, because I read the House report maybe a little differently than than, than Tom and Marine. I feel like the House report builds on um, the Stigler report, the UK report, the EU report, all of which sort of identify very sort of that a very unique set of circumstances that create significant threats to competition in platform markets, um, which I think they, they establish very effectively. And then they provide a broad range of potential solutions. And I think the real question for this report is, should those, those solutions be on the table? And, and should we be having a discussion? And I think we should. I think that they, they have more than met the, the burden and we need to be thinking about all of them. Um, doesn't mean that they're all right. Um, but I, I don't think the, the worry that we, I think those worries that are being raised are, are really about the merits of the proposals. But really at this point, the question is, should we be reopening the antitrust laws? And I think the, the report does a fabulous job of supporting that. Um, and then what did, I'm sorry, what did you want me to then address? <laughs> No, I did that one pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, that that was it was amazing. So why don't I? I mean, I think you you did just uh, kind of do a good job at def defending your position. And we are, as I said, we're kind of getting close on time, and we we at least have one question in the queue that I'd like to get to. So so Tom, you've been on the sidelines for for a little bit here. So and you started to preview this in your earlier comments about. Uh, unilateral conduct and some of the proposals to, to change presumptions there, like having abusive dominance and maybe moving the monopoly threshold to 30%. Uh, you know, what are some of your reactions to both that and the, uh, the, the, the nascent acquisitions that, that, that Maureen and, and Mike had discussed as well? So uh, feel free to react to any of those, those proposals to amend the antitrust laws. Sorry about that. Am I there? Okay. Um, I'll be real quick here. Um, uh, you know, and so I'm just going to talk generally. <laughs> One thing that that was missing from the House Judiciary Report, I mean, like a glaring omission, I think, is was error. You know, the idea that we're going to have errors with the rules. They're going to misfire. And, you know, this, we, we know that when you're regulating um, behavior, especially section two type behavior, um, exclusionary conduct, that uh, that's a tricky business. You know, there are plenty of things that firms do uh, that exclude their rivals by winning business from those rivals, but they're good things. So we, we have to have some way to identify unreasonably exclusionary conduct versus, you know, conduct that excludes, but is pro-competitive. And I think the courts have done a really pretty admirable job. If you look at the substantive standards, I wrote this piece for the Boston College Law Review a while back, um, uh, the, the Roberts Court and the Limits of Antitrust, but basically making the argument that what they're trying to do is to minimize the total cost of error, false positives, false negatives, administrative costs. Um, I, you know, the House Judiciary Committee report seems to think they've gotten this wrong and they recommend some changes, but they don't seem at all to, to be concerned about errors resulting from these changes. So, you know, some specific ones, um, getting rid of the likelihood recoupment of recoupment requirement for predatory pricing. This to me seems like a terrible idea. It's, it will, it's gonna chill price cuts, even when they're unlikely to result in later monopoly pricing. I mean, we're giving up the bird in the hand of low prices and we're not getting a bird in the bush of avoided monopoly. It wasn't going to happen. Um, overruling Trinco. I mean, Trinco, people hate Trinco. Um, but, you know, Justice Scalia in the Trinco opinion made some really important points that, that I, don't, I haven't seen addressed. Um, you know, 
having some sort of unilateral requirement of dealing with your rivals or requirement to deal with your rivals, you know, reduces the incentive to create a valuable asset. It reduces the likelihood that we're going to get more than one of these valuable assets by build when you can sponge off the person who's already created. It requires courts to act as central planners, figuring out the, the price that, you know, you're going to have to pay the owner of the essential facility. It encourages uh, dealing between rivals, which may result in collusion. I mean, those are significant concerns. Um, so, you know, I, my, 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 I, my, I think the better view is, or better approach is to stick with the process that we have. Um, you know, as Mike points out, the, the Judiciary Committee report, like the Furman report, like the Stigler report, points to, you know, these developments in digital markets that are different. There are giant network effects, both direct network effects and indirect network effects. Economies of scale are massive. So maybe things are different. But the great thing about our common law process of antitrust is that it can change when things change. As we, as we learn more, as business practices change, the law can evolve to accommodate those things. What I'm concerned with is that we, we will legislatively codify rules that are highly error prone. And I see a number of the suggestions in the House Judiciary Committee report as being precisely that sort of thing. Well, 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 thanks, Tom. Um, unfortunately, we're we're right up against time, but uh, I did. Maybe I'll give everyone uh, a, a really good question from from the audience, uh, and it, it would be a good way to give everyone a, an opportunity to close out. Uh, uh, the The question has to do with the fact that, you know, first of all, complimenting all of you on uh, laying out the issues and it really well but would also like to know what your predictions are for uh, how the next administration will, will, will handle these, these issues. So, you know, this is a panel about the antitrust and the next administration. So now it's time for you guys to make predictions that will be recorded and in the cloud forever. So we can go back. Uh, um, so uh, let me, uh, uh, I guess we'll, Maureen, uh, if you wanna, uh, if you want to, to take a first stab at that and, and add any closing remarks, uh, the floor is yours. Great. So, um, just kind of as a, a threshold matter, I want to say I agree with I agree with Michael that there these issues are all very worthy of discussion. Right. I'm not trying to say that we, we shouldn't close our eyes and say everything is perfect now. If there are any competitive things going on or things that we're missing or tools need to be improved. I think that's right, and I think I think we should do that. And I think in the new administration, we'll continue that inquiry. I think there will probably be big pressures on the agencies to bring more aggressive cases. But if they're not given the uh, the funds to do it, uh, I think that's going to be really difficult. And it means that cases where like people say, oh, you just do the easy cases. It's like, well, you mean the ones where the consumer harms the most evident, right? <laughs> so in a world of constrained um, resources, uh, you know, we, we just have to get the, you know, the, ba the balance right. Uh, but I do think that um, one, one thing that the report did also lay, lay out well is it's not that progress can't be made through the courts, but you need to lay the foundation to do that. And so to the extent these inquiries can lay a firm foundation, an empirical foundation, a scholarly foundation for saying we're missing important things that are affecting competition, I, I, I welcome that. I think that would be a good development. So Mike, uh, let, me, let me give you uh, a shot to, for any closing, closing thoughts, I know, uh, to react to anything and uh, to address uh, the audience question of what are your predictions of the next administration? How, how are they gonna handle this? All right, so since you gave me a, a, a slight chance for a rebuttal, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this even shorter. I think it's really hard to justify where the law, the courts are on exclusionary conduct. Uh, you know, a point, Howard Shalansky made this point back in 2013, that it's no, it's not even clear the government could win the AT&T case under Trinco. Okay, so like, uh, you can we talk about false positives all we want. That's a huge false negative. Um, but, so I'll just leave that there. Um, I think we don't know what the next administration is going to be like. Um, because I want to go back to where Maureen started us all with. Personnel is policy. And I think compared to 2008 and 2012, even 2016, within the Democratic Party, there are much more diverse views. And so 
the, you, the, the people who like, there are a much broader range of who could be running these agencies and they have very different views. And until we know that, um, I would say in general, I would expect that because the Democratic Party has moved, I think, to a more aggressive stance overall, that I would expect the, the Biden administration to be more aggressive. But in terms of things like, say, legislation, or we didn't, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to talk about the Office of Competition Policy, that may have a lot to do with what their other priorities are. Apparently, you know, apparently there's some reason why we're all staying home all the time. Um, you know, huge unemployment, you know, that, that, right, it's hard to know how all that's going to play out. So I, you know, I think we're still sort of in a wait and see. But, you know, as I said, bottom line, I would expect the agencies to be more, more um, aggressive. And I think that competition policy as a whole will be more important in a Biden administration than it has been in other recent Democratic or Republican um, administrations. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Tom, I'll uh, let you have the uh, last word as far as predictions on uh, what do you what do you think the the next administration will will look like? How are they going to address some of these problems? Or 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 or, or uh, um, you know, I, I didn't want to say how they can address these problems because I think that's putting something you're you know having having heard uh, a lot of what you've said uh, uh, for the for the most of this. Um, uh, discussion. Maybe you don't think there are a lot of problems, but what do you think? What are your what are your predictions for the next administration? Sorry, I did that again. I, I certainly think that uh, we will see more uh, aggressive challenges to mergers, especially those involving um, you know potential and nascent competitors. Um, I you know uh, I, I don't know how successful the a legislative agenda will be. Um, I certainly don't think it's going to look like what you see in the House Judiciary Committee report. I think when, you know, um, you're seeing one side of the story in that uh, in that report, and I think when we have to sit down and actually think about what are the potential adverse consequences of these proposals, that there will not be much enthusiasm for for many of them. Um, so to end, I would say one thing that would make me very happy. Uh, is if there were something like what um, uh, Mike and his co-authors have recommended with this Office, office of Competition Policy in the White House, um, which I, we can get a chance to talk about it, but I think that's, there's a, some really great, that's a really great idea uh, that there would be some sort of executive branch, a body that's um, similar, somewhat similar to OIRA that would sort of think globally about competition policy and think about the extent to which other regulatory agencies are creating competition problems. I would get very much behind that and I would be really happy if, uh, if that sort of thing were to emerge. Wow, that's great. We ended on some agreement here and that's uh, the, the, the office of, uh, an office of competition policy does sound like something uh, as someone who, uh, in, uh, when I began at the FTC working uh, for for Marine when uh, in uh, the Office of Policy Planning at the FTC, that's a lot of what uh, what the FTC was involved with the competition advocacy program. So I think it probably is something uh, that that we we could all get around. So uh, we're we're certainly over, and I, I appreciate uh, the panelists who I know are all busy indulging us in the audience for for an extra uh, ten minutes or so. I, I want to uh, thank you all so much for the, the, the uh, taking time out of the day and and for providing this, uh, you know, uh, having a, a great discussion here. We could have gone on a lot, uh, a lot longer. Uh, there's a lot to, a lot to, to unpack here. Uh, I also well, want to also just kind of do a shame, shameless plug or plug the Global Antitrust Institute's uh, report on the digital economy. There's a link to it in the announcement for the for for this and or you can find it at the GA website. Uh, Maureen, has, oh, we talked about Tom's chapter. Maureen has a, a great chapter on occupational licensing, which again is a uh, something I think that there's a lot of bipartisan appetite to, to, to deal with that uh, uh, as well. Uh, so so anyway, uh, again, let me thank the panelists and I believe we are adjourned. So so thanks a lot, Maureen, Tom, and Mike. I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.